Once again, thank you. I'm glad to have a little bit of time to have something to eat. Uh, so we'll, we'll just dive into this directly. The conversation today is about the road, the journey that we're taking on, on reconciliation. And of course, there's many, many turns and twists that we're encountering. Many questions, many uncertain outcomes, but that's the way things are right now. That's the way things have to be as we move along in this age of reconciliation. So, first contact, first words in the first 200 years. Just kind of put, in, put things into a bit of a context before we go into the uh, twists and turns parts of this conversation. But when the first explorers came into Canada, up to St. Lawrence, uh, up to Hudson, uh, these areas, they had asked a simple question because they didn't know this place existed. It wasn't on their maps prior to, to that time. So they asked, what do you call this place? And through gestures and interpretations and con uh, confirmation with each other, they figured, well, he's asking, what do, we, what do we call this place? And so the response from the indigenous people at the time, be it the Huron, be it uh, be it these other people, but they were all Algonquian speakers that we do know. And they, and, they, and they said, well, what do you call this place? And they said, Kanatan. Kanatan means a clean place, or a clean, pure, sacred place. This place is clean. But when you shorten it to Kanata, it becomes to make pure, clean, and sacred. So that then sets up the understanding for Canada in early Canadian history, is the understanding of how we see this land. But in order to achieve that purity and that cleanliness and that sacredness, our relationships need to be in order, our relationships with not only ourselves as human beings, not only yourself as an individual, but also your relationship with the earth, the environment, the spirit world, all of these different parts of who we are. And as a part of establishing relationships with the newcomers, there is a long-standing tradition of treaty-making, peace-making. It was a part of our customs and our understanding that before you could, before conflict, we need to make treaties. We need to make peaceful relationships to avert any conflicts that we may have. So the process of treaty making was a very sacred <coughs> ceremony. It was something that we did together to bring peace, to understand how are we going to have a relationship with each other. So the treaty making process and the treaty and the understandings that have been garnered from it becomes a sacred covenant. And it's witnessed by the Creator. And this is consistent throughout all of our treaties in Canada and North America, and certainly around the world with other indigenous traditions. Because treaty making was a way to ensure that we can mutually benefit from each other's gifts that we have. So then treaty and the words of the treaty and the oral history of the treaties become sacred texts and need to be honored as such because they remind us what our relationship is about and what our relationship is supposed to be. So when we talk about sharing, when we talk about living in peace, this becomes, these become also verbs. They become directives. And it's about how we look after one another and how we share what we have. In 1630, to express this a little bit more and give you a couple of uh, examples, the two row wampum was a peace and friendship treaty. Now, here in Alberta, we also look at our treaties, our numbered treaties, as peace and friendship treaties, because they rest on the same values and the same value system. Of, of the historical concept and spiritual concept of, of treaty making. So the two world wampum was a, a, a treaty between the Iroquois Confederacy, the Five Nations, and the Dutch. And, what, and I'll show you a picture of it later. But there is a, a wampum belt made with wampum shells, 
purple and white. There's two rows of uh, purple wampum with three white bands across it, which mean peace, friendship, and respect. And what that story told of this two row wampum is that it told that you will have your boat on this great river of life. We will have our canoe on this great river of life. And we will share this river side by side. But our boats will not touch. We will not go into your boat and try to steer it and determine its destination. As you will not come into our canoe and try to determine our destination. But we will go down this river like brothers and sisters, sharing this great wealth of life that we share here in this place that we call Canada. So it becomes then a peaceful and prosperous coexistence, which then becomes the basis for many other treaties that stem from this foundational treaty as well. And of course, other alliances, indigenous people made alliances with all the newcomers that they came with. I mean, for example, the Mi'kmaq or the Wabanaki Confederacy, for example, was with the French, the Wendat with the Huron, and sometimes these would change with other groups of people as well, as times, politics, and issues changed as well. But what was key is the necessity of having a relationship, the necessity of having something that held us together, that helped us share a common vision, something that we both would learn from, from each other. Next. So that, those treaties and those processes were really with the backbone of Indigenous Canada relations up until around 1812, where we start to see the issue of the Indian problem. So we have both the birth of Canada and the birth of the Indian problem simultaneously happening around 1812. Policies of isolation and assimilation then start to be thought about, start to be tasked. And there's a whole, there's a whole line of, of, of history that speaks about this. One example here is in 1841, Dr. Herman Merivale, Professor of Political Economy at the Oxford and Under Secretary of the State for the Canadian Colonies, believed it was essential to civilize the Indian population and develop four policy alternatives to the crown. Extermination by death or enfranchisement. Slavery. Isolation, that's reserves. And also assimilation. Now, the extermination uh, is something that, of course, wasn't really popular at the time. Uh, slavery, well, the historical um, um, uh, record of indigenous people in enslavement that didn't work out too well, because we tend to you know, not be really great at uh, heavy manual labor, uh, but also uh, the insulation part, where they would assume that if you isolate indigenous people into like a far off piece of land or something and, and just leave them be, that they would somehow die off. But if you leave indigenous people in the woods, they tend to prosper and do quite, quite well. So that didn't work. So assimilation then became the logical course of action. Of course, there's spectrums to assimilation as well. So the, the crowd then is deciding through a number of uh, communications and dialogues of what are they going to do with this assimilation strategy? How are they going to assimilate indigenous people? And of course, the crown then decides to become, to become involved in Indian education out of the results of the Bajot Commission that was done in, 19, in 1842, 1844. The first official document that uh, paves the way for the establishment of government-funded schools that would teach English language and customs and erased Indian culture. Forced assimilation and cultural genocide with the aim of depression of dispossession of all lands and claims to land becomes the guiding principles in addressing the Indian problem. See, a part of the problem there is that indigenous people had a rightful claim to lands. Now, there's another very famous and, and foundational act uh, in Canada called the 1763 Royal Proclamation, where they recognized, and the, the, royal, uh, the British government at the time recognized that indigenous people, in fact, have the right and are the first owners, uh, in their understanding of things, to 
that land. And that land cannot be taken away from indigenous people unless it's done through treaty. And it's done only with the ground. And so that then established a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. It confirmed the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Our earlier treaties had already confirmed that in our own way and understanding of doing things. So then the problem then becomes is how do you remove that? So something had to be done, some strategy had to be implemented. And of course, forced assimilation then would do what? It re would remove your identity from who you are. It would remove your sense of being in connection to your own culture and to your own land. So the assumption is, is that you would no longer be indigenous. And once you learned of all the greatness that the Western society had, you would denounce <coughs> your, your, your indigenous worldview and your indigenous life and assimilate, theoretically, into the body politic. 1847, more specifically to education, Edgar Ryerson, father of Ontario Education, Ryerson University, as we know, produces a, another report for the superintendent general of Indian Affairs. He recommends, uh, uh, his recommendations become the model for Indian residential schools based on religious and domestic education. There is a need to raise the Indians to the level of the whites and take control of land out of Indian hands. This sentiment, this idea, this concept um, flies in the face of those who will say, that well, we were just trying to give you, you know, some good education and skills and you know to survive in the world and that sort of thing. But in fact, no, it was meticulous. The method of removal was very clear and, and direct. So then this attitude becomes the new normal for the next uh, hundred years or so. More probably 130, I think it is. Please. So we know that there's over 150,000 indigenous children attended. Uh, the residential school, and that's a conservative number. Um, we don't know how many indigenous people have died in those schools. The numbers vary from 20 to 50 percent, uh, at least. They stopped counting the deaths of indigenous people, uh, kids after 1920. Um, so we really don't know. And then how kids were registered, they disappeared. Uh, some said they were discharged, but the parents never knew whatever happened to their children. So there's still a lot of work in on uncovering that needs to be done around that. Not to mention the loss of language and culture. When you pull someone out of their psychological framework, when you remove them from the heart and the spirit of who they are, I don't care where you come from, you will suffer dissonance, cultural dissonance, identity dissonance. You become uh, imbalanced. There was an interesting study done uh, in Corrections Canada. I'm going to go back about 25 years or so. The, uh, the new um, director or head honcho of uh, Corrections Canada, a uh, Danish gentleman, uh, when he was looking at the, at the corrections and all the numbers, he noticed that there was a huge over-representation of indigenous people within the criminal justice system. So he wanted to find out why. So he commissioned uh, a little study asking some basic questions to the, uh, to the inmates, the incarcerated adults. Uh, about why they were there. So he asked a question. Do you consider yourself practicing your traditional ways? Do you consider yourself totally assimilated and don't practice your indigenous ways? Do you see yourself in between both worlds? And I'm simplifying the questions, of course, I fancy your language for that. But the results that he found was, was astounding. Out of uh, utilizing the standard social sciences numbers, out of 100,000 count of the population, the average Canadian, assembled Canadian, if you want to call it that, a Canadian just generally, the numbers are 120 to 100,000 who are in, in prison. When he looked at the numbers of how many indigenous people who were practicing their traditions considered themselves traditional, he didn't find any. What he found is that the Aboriginal or Indigenous people who said that they were cut, uh, who were fully assimilated were 120 out of 100,000. And then for those who, um, uh, for the vast majority of the, of the people that were incarcerated, it was, I think, 3,000 
of 100,000 count. We're the ones who identified as being caught in between two worlds. Right? And a part of the, of the idea of the, of, the, of the two canoes in the river, one of the teachings that had come out of it is that if you put one foot in one canoe and a, another foot in another canoe, you're going to fall in. <laughs> and those are the numbers of people that we see within our corrections systems. And that's why at that time, back in the 80s and the 90s, they started bringing cultural programming. And what they saw from that was the recidivism rate started to drop dramatically for indigenous people. Because once they started to get grounded, getting back to dealing with the issues of identity dissonance, those are the healings that we need. Because the thing that you need most is what you've lost in order to replenish and to refill yourself as an individual. Of course, then, because of those sorts of things, we see relationship loss, family breakdown. Um, when the kids would come back from residential schools, and my, my grandfather and my great-grandfather talked about, well, we don't recognize them. They don't act like us any longer. So there's a strain. There becomes a distance even within the family relationships. And of course, loss of treaty, treaty rights, loss of human rights, and the loss of our economies. One thing we have to remember that indigenous um, peoples had their own economies, well-grounded, working economies. And so and those were decimated as well as a part of the assimilation program. Um, even so much as when we did adopt um, economic standards, like agriculture, for example, on the plains here, there were a number of First Nations that became quite successful in producing bumper crops and quality crops. But it's interesting to note that once that started to happen, the competition was something that the locals did not like because they couldn't sell their uh, quality product as well. So regulations were created where produce from the First Nations could not be sold unless it went through the Indian agent. And oftentimes those, those produces would just be left to rot or not, not sold at all. So you can't build an economy when you're in prison. You can't build an economy when it's consistently being undermined. And so this then becomes another layer to the foundation of what is causing poverty within our communities. And the other thing, of course, is racism, discrimination, and prejudice. The policies didn't just create regulations and policies to limit indigenous participation, it also fostered the worldview on indigenous people by the rest of society. It taught you how to think about indigenous people, taught you what to assume about indigenous people, taught you what not to give indigenous people, and it became a societal norm. And it's still here, it's something that we're still dealing with, and it's something that we're going to have to deal with for a while. And of course, poverty is that, that great thing that we're still trying to address as well. So, as we go into you know, the age of reconciliation, and believe me, this is the dawning of the age of reconciliation. And it is because we are now positioning ourselves in some uncertain territory as to where are we going, how are we going to deal with these issues, and what are the broader issues. The UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People is a wonderful document. It has 46 articles. I encourage you to read it. There's a lot of answers in there. The 94 Calls to Action by the uh, TRC is a wonderful document as well. It has some, it has some really good suggestions in there, but also uh, it's, it's missing some, some, some ideas as well. Uh, but I won't be talking about those. Um, so, relationship repair and rebuilding is hard work. Any relationship, be it personal or collective, or from society to society or nation to nation, it is hard work. But it needs to be done if we want to move forward and get past what has happened to us as indigenous people, but equally what has happened to Canadians as well. There are assumptions that, well, you Aboriginal people had it pretty rough, that I would acknowledge. And that is true, yes we have. However, Canada and its, and its populations and its society has also suffered from it. 
at a depth at which they're not really too fully aware of as of yet. But as we move along and we start having conversations and really start digging at the foundation of the issues, we'll start to see where that pain rests and how it affects you to this day. That's why saying sorry is not enough. It's one thing for a government to say, we're sorry, that was a lousy thing that happened. And it's, it's nice to at least hear that, but that's not the only form of apology, because apology also is a, an action word. It's also going to be generational work as we start uncovering these things. It's going to take many generations to recover from this. To achieve re real reconciliation in this country, the people must sit with one another and talk. Elijah Harper told me that when they had announced the, uh, the TRC. Him and I were having a conversation. Um, I forgot what city he was in, but when I was asking him, I said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, he said, I don't, he said, the politicians, they'll talk about reconciliation. The politicians will create some wonderful things. There's lots of money is going to flow. He said, but that's not going to be the answer. It's when the people, the grassroots people he was referring to, you and I, when we sit and we talk with one another, the conversation is a two-way conversation. It's not me just telling you the travesties of our history, but it's you also telling us your stories as well. Because there's a secret here, is that from an indigenous perspective, when we share stories about each other, and we start to see ourselves in your stories, that's the first small step towards reconciliation. When we start to understand each other's pain, we take another step towards reconciling. But it's reconciling as brothers and sisters and not reconciling into one system. So in other words, indigenous people don't need to reconcile to fit into the, the intellectual, social paradigm of what we call Canadian society. We need to reconcile with our own culture, going back to those two boats in the river, is that we have to make sure that we are strong as well, once again, to take control of our own destinies. The other great teaching here is that you cannot build a relationship on guilt. And I warn my own people, and I warn uh, the society in general, is don't do something because you feel guilty about it. Seek understanding. Truly try to embrace what the story is that's being shared and the implications and the depth that it has and what application it has in your life. Because if you build a relationship on guilt, it'll quickly turn to resentment. And resentment will quickly turn to the experiences that we've had before. And as they say, we are doomed to repeat if we do not learn from what has happened. Next. So, restitution within an indigenous context is a part of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a broader context. Restitution is about acknowledging what was taken, replacing what you can, accepting responsibility for it. Reconciliation is a verb as well. Reconciliation is a process. It's a ceremony in its own right, but it brings you to a certain point. And it's something that is continuous and ongoing. Land and money is always important. It's a part of it, but it's not the only part for pragmatic reasons. We need more money for education for the students. We need more money for our, our child care. Uh, as well. So these are practical solutions. It's not the payment plan that was established by the payout system of the residential schools, which I'm, su I'm sure that the survivors needed. I know my father needed it. I know my mother needed it. But it also brought with it, here's one of those turns to one of those twists to that. While the appearance of giving money is an act of restitution, it also then re-injures the individuals who's receiving the money. Suicide rates went up 
amongst indigenous school survivors after that. The generosity, well, yeah, it was there, but this is the consequence of, of, of that action. Um, relationship then becomes the critical part of that restitution. It's about understanding where do we sit? How do we make decisions? So how do I make decisions about myself? How do we reestablish those key relationships that we need? And control, getting back into control of, of your life, and particularly as a, as a First Nation. How do we control our own natural resources? Right now, you have to go through a process of seven different levels in order to get a housing approval to build a house in a First Nation. Seven. So you, you know, and you wonder why we have housing shortages on, on First Nations, because the control is not for First Nations. If somebody asks me, they have, who is your Grand Chief? I say, well, Minister Bennett is my Grand Chief. The reason why I say that, because this is a fact, is that Minister Bennett has total control over all the decisions that any First Nation makes in Canada. She decides unilaterally and can unilaterally. The last government regime decided that they would uh, expand those powers. So now the Minister of Indian Affairs can unilaterally make a decision for the betterment of any community that uh, an open pit mine is a good idea just down the road because it will create jobs and it's going to create all this benefit. That's what could the theoretically happen. Of course, it's preposterous, but you never know. Um, so then how do we take control of protecting what we know to be ours? Because the traditional lands that surround First Nations, by law, have to be, and this is the contradiction, you'll see that, it's like a schizophrenic relationship. On one hand, the, the Supreme Court says, yes, we have, we have control over our lands, our traditional territories, the, the country has to honor uh, the treaties, it has to honor that, they, uh, that the exploration of the lands only can be assigned by the First Nations. That's been held up. But then creating regulations on another side, they're saying, well, we're just going to make decisions for you and how you do that. That's still a reality today. And that's a, that's a huge problem. So control then becomes uh, a catchword. So understanding and honoring treaty rights will be critical. Treaty rights, treaties were created, particularly in earnest from about 1850 on up to uh, uh, present day, actually. But what's interesting, is that while they were making treaties, they were also building this thing called the Indian Act. The Department of Indian Affairs is not the buddy of, um, of treaties. They actually work counter to it. That's why you have that parallel schizophrenic relationship. Because on one hand, you have, oh, we're honoring the treaties, oh, we're honoring the crown, yes, we must do all these great things. But through legislation and other procedures, they remove treaty rights simultaneously. And that's not the arbitrariness of how this works. Another important part, another turn that we have to come to grips with is that as we move along, we have to banish the old academic ideas that indigenous knowledge was subpar, substandard, that sort of thing, etc., etc. Seventy percent of the food that we eat on our plate in North America comes from indigenous horticulturalists and farmers and biologists for thousands of years. Uh, all kinds of different tasty corn, tomatoes, peanuts, all kinds of different things came from indigenous horticulturalists. Um, pharmaceuticals, about 70% that you buy across the counter at your drugstore came from indigenous pharma pharmaceutical experts, if you want to call them that. So what we've got to do is we've got to step away from the idea that indigenous knowledge, the way of knowing and healing uh, is, 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 is within our grasp. That within the communities, the communities hold within them answers and solutions to what's hurting their community, what's hurting the individuals with them. That is there. We need to exercise those practices. What happens now is that when we start, it seems that we're moving forward, and yes, you know, let's bring in the indigenous stuff and stuff like this, but critical parts within that decision-making process are removed. While you might have a talking circle, you might have an elder come in and do a ceremony, you might have an elder come in and open with a prayer, you might acknowledge Treaty 6. When it comes down to making the decisions, it's not in their hands still. 
that, that has to be changed. Because indigenous people have a role in national governance and policy. And that we can expect to have some pushback as well. But exactly what does that look like will be the larger question. What role does indigenous thought, philosophy, worldview have in shaping the policy of the direction that this country goes? That's going to be a twist. That's going to turn things in a different way. Please. So the strategy, of course, language profession, I always say when people ask me, well, what can we do to, to uh, help fix things, make things right? Well, put back what was stolen, what was taken away, our languages. Our language preservation created a, a, an official Indigenous Languages Act to help protect Indigenous languages. That'll be a, a, a good step forward. Um, and of course, that always brings up other issues of how it's going to be managed and this and that and so forth and so on. But we do have the intelligence to make it happen. And it can happen. And I, and I think our, our national chief is already making this suggestion to, uh, to the federal government. Support access to cultural programs, especially in urban areas. Seventy percent of the Aboriginal population today is not in their traditional community. They're not living on the First Nations. I think about 55 percent of First Nations are actually living in their urban centers. Now, and I'll tell you why. Reserves were never meant to contain us, at least in this part of the, the country. We were not, the idea of reserved lands when we made this treaty, because my great great grandfather, Mustus, um, uh, was the originator of that treaty with his brothers Canusio and, and all these other signatories. And, and uh, Papas Chase is my fourth great uncle from Treaty 6, and Michelle Kelly, who uh, was uh, sign both these guys were signatories of. Treaty 6. But what our understanding was, the lands that we, we set aside that we call reserves were reserved lands for Indians in the sense that it was a place we can go back to if we need to recover, to recoup, to do ceremonies, to retire to. It wasn't a place to hold us contained at all. So what, what do we see? Edmonton here, we have um, you know, a large urban indigenous population. Uh, with 55% First Nations living here, because they're following that tradition of hunting, the tradition of seeking prosperity. So that hasn't changed in our hearts in terms of who we are. Another help to bridge this is the inclusion of Indigenous history and Indigenous participation in Canadian history in education and public celebration. We need to see more of that. Because reflectivity, cultural reflectivity, is a very important part of any person's development. My brother and I were growing up here in Edmonton. We didn't see much of ourselves here. You know, we had to sneak away to the library and kind of find things there. And, and there, there's there's a there's a sculpture a sculpture behind the uh, library uh, that uh, as of this no name Indian with a sea court, right? And, Talking with the artist about that several years later, he goes, well, I just made it up. It's no one in particular. It just took a little bit of here, a little bit of there. Because <laughs> I was looking at him saying, well, this guy isn't from here because he's not dressed for the environment. <laughs> he's just wearing a breech cloth and a headdress. <laughs> so anyway, but that was pretty much it. So I made it a personal commitment myself to work towards creating indigenous space within, uh, within uh, the city and reflect indigenous knowledge, reflect indigenous presence in the city as well. And that was a time in the mid-70s when there were only 5,000 or so uh, identified indigenous people within the city itself. Now there's 67,000. So it's, it's a lot of, you're, you're surrounded. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, if you're not gonna laugh, you're gonna scream. Okay, uh, so striving to understand and embrace indigenous worldview in relation to the issues of the day. Indigenous traditional thinkers, indigenous people in general have, have a unique way of looking at things that I think provide some unique information on how we deal with issues. Issues of conflict, issues that are affecting us all. Indigenous people want to be a part of the solution and not just be focused at as, as the uh, one to be resolved, rather to engage them in dialogue about how we deal with the issues of the day. And that's something that I've struggled to do with the city police here. 
while I have been known to be critical of the city police, and it's, it's for good cause, and I, but I've also admired their work and have said so as well. But I said, you know, if you would just create a council of elders, of community leaders, let us meet with you on a regular basis to talk about the broader issues. I'm not going to tell you how to be, how to be policemen or what you should do, but we need to talk about the issues together so we can better understand how we can help you, and then you can better understand how we can help each other. Okay. So, beware of entitlement. And that's the other part that's attached to guilt. Because then this is a warning to my own people. It's not to be, or have the sense that we are entitled to something because of the struggles that we have gone through. And I see that happening from time to time, and it frustrates me. Yes, we need to seek out restitution. Yes, we need the acknowledgments. But we should not position ourselves in any organization or in any movement that we have with the attitude of being entitled. You have to make room at that table for me. You have to serve me because of all that bad stuff that happened. That's going to be a part of the healing process that we have to work through. Reclaiming economic self-sufficiency in the fight for indigenous space. Expect pushback. When we're dealing with economics, real economics and real politics, when indigenous people start to take up space, there is always pushback. Our history of indigenous relations in economics bears that out. And it's been borne out even more recently, like the fishing licenses in, in the West Coast, the salmon licenses, the lobster licenses with the new law. When we start to get what is rightfully indigenous um, you know, rights to hunt, fish, and exercise that, there's that pushback. It's the resistance. There's this idea that we are getting leverage over and above when really we're just trying to get back into what was right for the art that we've been deprived of for the last hundred years or so. So there will be pushback. The Indian Act has to go. Um, and it does. But the question becomes within the indigenous community, within the First Nations communities, well, what's going to replace it? If you remove the only um, political and legal mechanism within the governance structure that has created conduits and responsibilities into the federal government. You remove that, you destroy that connection. So there's an inherent danger in immediately removing it, of course. But what needs to be done is you need to create a suite of indigenous legislations that then you sunset the Indian Act in order to bring in that. But then what happens, and what's happening already, and we're seeing little signs of it, is the Métis, the Inuit, and the First Nations are three different peoples altogether, three different baskets. I mean, even when you look at the Inuit population, they differ themselves from community to community. Look at the Métis community with their issues amongst themselves in terms of identity, definition, and all those sorts of things as a whole other basket. And then you have First Nations, the way they see themselves in terms of how they control their own economics and their own politics. We will expect conflict. Struggle, when I mean conflict, I don't necessarily mean violence. What I mean is more pushing up against each other. One example is the federal court just acknowledged and recognized the Métis <coughs> as to be treated as Indians. That means there's a treaty coming for the Métis. That means the First Nations already are not really happy about that fact. Right? There's a whole issue of Rupert's land that hasn't been dealt with yet. Who does the land belong to? The Métis say it's ours because it was supposed to be given to us. The First Nations say, no, 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 no it doesn't. It's, it's our traditional territory. So there's issues that, are, that we can expect to see. But that's a part of that reconciliation as well amongst ourselves, politically, as, as indigenous people as well. And if we don't do this reconciliation properly, we are in a dangerous position of recolonizing indigenous people and exercising further assimilation. Because you have to keep in mind that we are indigenous people, indigenous people, not all of them, of course, we are not trying to just fit into Canadian society. We're trying to restructure our indigenous institutions so that we can teach our children better. We want, like those two boats again, to be side by side with each other. 
To reconcile means to understand each other, to learn from each other in terms of what it is we need to do and what you're doing, but how do we share that river again? So that, that becomes then uh, an important memory because if we're just talking about saying, oops, sorry about the residential schools and you know, here's a little bit of money without really changing the foundation and, and the deepness of the colonial mentality and how it still is at the foundation of Canadian thought. Good intentions, I call it the Good Intentions Paving Company, because what happens is, is that if you don't change the foundation of how you think about things, you're never going to change your situation and you're never going to have a chance to really move towards that true and deeper reconciliation. So reconciliation is about putting the relationship back together and charting a new course, because that's the direction that, that we have to go, or else we are truly going to be doomed and repeating everything again. Some of these issues that I've brought up are some of the twists and the turns to the stories that are starting to come out. But be aware of it. What's going to be key is how you are going to participate in those dialogues and how you're going to participate with the grassroots, how you're going to participate with your own political leaders. So there's a lot, a lot more coming our way and it's, and it's generational work. So as I was talking about Kanata, and this is the uh, two row one for this. Kanata, if we can re-envision it, might be a key in terms of how we see this new relationship. Kanata, to make clean, pure, sacred. In order to achieve that, we have to make sure that our relationships get back into order. But also, let's not have rosy glasses and think that all relationships are, are perfect. Of course they're not. But if you commit to a process, a ceremony of relationship, with the concept of kanata being the verb in how our country moves forward, then I think then we have some very strong possibilities and more probable that we will achieve that reconciliation that we all we all want peace, respect, and friendship. And that is what these three lines are about within this document. And that truly is the foundation of our treaty relationships all across Canada as well. So I think we do have the answers. I think we just have to learn how to see again. And that's everything. Thank you.